Alright, um, so welcome uh, to Archeo Viking. Today we have uh, a, another special uh, video. Uh, I have a guest uh, on uh, at my channel with me in a Discord run by friends. Uh, uh, my guest is Archeo Wolf. Uh, say hi, Archeo Wolf. Hi, Archeo Wolf. <laughs> Uh, you, you could you couldn't expect me to do that and not no no uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we are here in this uh, discord uh, server to um, uh, we've been requested to come here to teach uh, the basics of the archaeological method as well as to take a look at why the archaeological method is what it is ie uh, take a look at the very dark and unfortunate past of archaeology. So, I imagine everyone watching the video and in the Discord uh, probably got their uh, start of archaeology based off of uh, the Indiana Jones movies. Um, all three of them. All three of them. <clears throat> uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Temple of Doom, and, La and The Last Crusade. That or uh, the Tomb Raider games. Um, pick your poison. Most people in our generation learn from archaeology uh, <laughs> based off of these. Or, or maybe the Mummy movies. You know. Again, take your pick. However, uh, as Archaeo Wolf and I can attest, that's not how archaeology is at fucking all. It looks essentially like this. <laughs> if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yes. I just gotta throw that out there. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. That is very true. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, archaeology is, is a science, despite what a lot of people try to claim. It's Even some archaeologists try to claim that it's... Um, not a science, it's a vocation. I disagree. We use the scientific method, uh, so it is a science in my opinion. Uh, uh, but that's essentially what, this is essentially the, I don't want to say the end stage of archaeology, but this is w one of the sort of end stages of archaeology. Um, essentially being in a lot of w weird, cramped positions trying to get to artifacts. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Now, the, before we go into um, the archaeological method, as well as archaeology's history, I think it's very important to take, to take a look at uh, probably the most important thing, at least that Archie Wolf and I uh, feel like we need to address um, almost always at this point, especially in the past few weeks, is the Ooh. various laws that protect archaeological resources. Um, laws that uh, I know for the companies I work for, I am beholden to, and I would, and I also know that Archaeowolf is beholden to. And so is everyone else. Most definitely. Yeah. So, and, I, and, and they are all in order. They are all the laws within the U.S. Now, there's a lot of laws in other countries that I could not even hope to fit into this presentation because then it would be like a 40-hour presentation just on the laws alone. Uh, but I did uh, provide the ones in the U.S. as well as the FBI and Interpol's stance on uh, their their um, stances on archaeology and the looting of archaeological resources. I'm going to need that Interpol one if you... Uh... If what? you remember later, I'd like you to send me that. The Interpol later? Okay, yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you'll I see it. You also see it here too. But uh, so the first law or law uh, surrounding um, involving archaeological resources uh, was created in 1906 by Theodore Roosevelt uh, mm -hmm. and the Congress under him, uh, the Antiquities Act, which is essentially what it, what it says here on this picture I uh, took of the law itself, uh, i.e., you know, protect historical landmarks, whether they be historic or 
it says prehistoric. I, I don't like that term. I prefer pre-Columbian or pre-contact, yeah. but whatever. Uh, prehistoric structures, uh, and they are essentially the uh, owned by the government uh, in our national monuments. Um, and that and that's remained that way to this day. Uh, in fact, do, unless it's like a site that has a flake or a piece of pottery, um, generally archaeological sites are put on a registry and are monitored by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and then we, after that, we had the Historic Sites Act of 1935, which again, is as it describes, um, it's essentially just a strengthening of the Antiquities Act um, in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of these laws are sort of redundant or sort of strengthening previous laws, essentially. Um, and, you know, you can take time to read it, uh, you know, in the video later or what have you. But this is essentially what it says, you know, uh, policy pre preserving historic uh, or pre-contact slash prehistoric landmarks empowers the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of Interior to preserve these archaeological sites and other related documents, as well as uh, formalize, it formalized the National Park Surface programs such as uh, salvage archaeology and things like that. Uh, mainly to put people to work during the Great Depression. Uh, Dan, can I address something to that real quick? What uh, you can what? Can, um, so with the 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 Act in 1935, uh -huh. this was directly results of the uh, WPA programs put okay. forth during the Depression. Okay. Because when you when a lot of the big infrastructure things that we kind of take for granted today. Yeah. We look at and fear like Hoover Dam um, and Lake Mead and stuff like that. Part of DR's programs to get people to, to, to keep money flowing through the economy mm. was to do a lot of these big uh, development projects that okay. um, would have a real hard time getting pushed through today because people him and haw about money. Of so course. Highways camp areas, dams, and irrigation systems and such. This um, this comes about because of the amount of work that's being that was being done in undeveloped places on either federal land or state land mm -hmm. that needed to have cultural sites and resources addressed. Yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And boy, I would love uh, a another version of this law passed because there are so many sites uh, that are not getting the funding done to them that are being threatened by development right now. Uh, oh, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we have uh, these three laws, which are, um, as you can see, there's the Reservoir Salvage Act of 1960, uh, which allowed for... The, you know, the excavation and salvage of sites um, under water reservoirs and dams and things like that, um, which is not perfect, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, especially when up until like the 90s, the TVA was doing everything they could in the various other versions of the TVA uh, across the U.S. Uh, were doing their own everything they fucking could to... Uh, push through these regulations uh, and build dams. Uh, and I know this because I've talked with, uh, I'm actually friends with somebody who used to work for um, the TVA during that time. So I sort of know some of their dirty little secrets. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I'm not going to name the person I know, nor am I going to name what they did, but they were not doing very good things. In fact, Sorry, it wasn't uh, 90s. Sorry, Jimmy Carter is the one who got involved. So it was like the, the 80s. But anyways, regardless, the point is they were doing shady shit uh, until the government had to get involved. But the, the law was at least created with some intent to protect uh, and salvage uh, things that were in danger of destruction by uh, dam projects and things like that. 
Uh, there's also the Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which was an amendment of the one from 1949, um, requiring uh, the establishment of a nationwide system for identifying, protecting, rehabilitating uh, historic places and artifacts uh, and historic sites. Uh, then you have the uh, NEPA, um, which of course makes me think of the Simpsons movie because it does. Anyways, uh, or the National Environmental Policy Act um, that you know went beyond the protection and laid down comprehensive policies uh, and resource management plans for these protections. Uh, then you have uh, one that I've been talking about a lot recently, and so has Archie Wolf and basically every other fucking archaeologist on social media. <clears throat> uh, the Archaeological and Historic Preservation Act, or APA, uh, from 1974, uh, it, which again, as I said earlier, is essentially in a, an update of the earlier Reservoir Salvage Act. Um, uh that says, as it says, uh, essentially uh, to uh, better uh, deal with the preservation of archaeological and historical data uh, that would otherwise be lost um, to all federal construction, not just construction of dams. Uh, federal agencies must notify the Secretary of Interior um, if activities will affect these historic sites or archaeological uh, resources. Uh, and then, you know, the funding was provided uh, by the agency or with the interior funds, etc., etc. Uh, then we have the uh, Sunken Military Act, uh, Military Craft Act, <clears throat> which was created uh, in the 1990s but was updated in 2004. Um, and it's essentially what it sounds like to salvage <laughs> military. Yep. Um, aircraft and military ships and things like that via archaeological methods and things all kinds of things especially with the growing concern of people who would dive to loot these items mm -hmm. uh, uh, which again is still a massive problem uh, and it you know provides tools for management of sunken military craft uh, including a permitting program uh, establishment of civil penalties uh Yes, mm -hmm. you will go to jail for looting. I'm sorry, people you can who are watching this or who are on social media, you can claim that you won't, but you fucking will. Stop it. And also, yeah. let me go ahead and t do a side note. To anybody watching who's going to say, why aren't you talking professionally? We've t we've tried. Archaea Wolf and every other archaeologist have tried to be kind and to be helpful, and it hasn't worked. In fact, one of our colleagues was far more civil and helpful than we were than Archie Wolf and I were and she was blocked and immediately called a ginger bitch yeah literally uh so no we are under no <laughs> we are under no obligation to be nice to fucking looters anyways yeah. uh and then one it, of the things about the sunken military craft uh -huh. act the uh -huh. reason why it is so why it came about is because of a salvage project that was done off of Martha's Vineyard. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, of a uh, F6F Hellcat. Uh-huh. That apparently had been well known about. Divers used to visit it all the time. Um, and a museum wanted to get their hands on one. Oh. And there's this one that was relatively easy to get to. Yeah. And apparently they went through the Navy. They went to the Navy and they said, hey, A, B, C, D. And no one at the Navy ever responded. Uh -huh. So somebody said, well, if they don't want it, we'll just take it. Oh, God. And one of the biggest issues about that is they lifted this airplane out of the ocean, put it on a barge, took it to Martha's Vineyard, and the military police met him there and yep. arrested everybody <laughs> because that airplane had been identified as one where the pilot was missing. Oh. And... What the concern was is that that aircraft had human remains in it yeah. of, of an American serviceman. What happened was, you know, um, is that the individual was not in the plane. Yeah. 
and it's thought that he actually got out, um, deployed his life raft, but because he had gone down in some ugly weather, he they just never found it. Yeah. One of the biggest reasons why this is in place is because of the number of American servicemen who are still on those vessels. Yeah. And that's um, very understandable. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is why you cannot dive in Pearl Harbor yep. at all unless you are part of the Park Service, part of the Navy, or you are a professional in respect to like underwater welding or underwater utilities because there are, you know, the the, the plumbing and the power yeah. lines and everything that go to Fort Island. Yeah. If you are not any of those individuals, cannot be in the water in Pearl Harbor. Not that you'd want to, because I think it's pretty gross, but... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and this law applies to all U.S. military craft across the globe, uh, as well as sunken... as well as to foreign sunken military craft that the, that rest in U.S. Uh, waters. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and things like that. Then we have to go... the... Uh, other law, one of the other laws that Archaea Wolf and every other archaeologist on social media has been barking about, uh, myself included, on uh, for the past few weeks, is the archaeological um, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979, uh, which mm -hmm. was passed as a result of looting incidents, uh, and it protects yep. all archaeological sites on federal uh, and Indian lands, and also state lands, I believe. Um, uh, Archie Wolf can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and it defines the state lands is uh, the state lands is under state jurisdiction. Okay. However, um, when this law was passed, every single state pretty much went copy paste. Yeah. yeah. And the changes in the law language is instead of federal and Indian lands, state and Indian lands. <laughs> it's it's state. Well, it's it's they it's actually state agency lands. Oh. The reason why Indian lands is not on there is because the uh, Indian lands is technically under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is a federal agency. Ah. So well, if a looting event is happening on the Salish Reservation, it is a federal crime before it is a state crime. Yeah. And that that's it makes a lot of sense and that's very true uh and, and one it, of the things i found out about this oh sorry to, sorry to no you. that's okay you do one of the things i found out about this is that this applies to it it, it supersedes the the tribe whose reservation it is oh technically individuals on the reservation cannot uh participate in looting activities if it is on the reservation yeah because it's not tribal government it's federal government and i know there's going to be some people that say hey that's not cool because it's their stuff but the moment you give one you get, the moment you give a mouse a, a cookie right yeah it's going to become an issue well, now in my experience especially out west here um the indigenous cult uh groups they don't want stuff excavated. Yeah. If it does not have to be, or the, the project can change to um, uh, consider their wishes, the sites do not get excavated. Yeah. You know, human remains don't get moved. If they're not going to be disturbed. Um, there's there's a, uh, about 32 burials underneath the new temping, or the new parking lot of the Tempe Police Department. Yep. Because when that project was done, the tribe was called, and they were like, "Well, are, what's the project? What's what's the impact?" And the impact was, the project was going to grade six inches down, and it was going to be thirteen inches of three quarter minus fill, yep. and twelve inches of asphalt. And they were like, "Make it twenty four inches." of three-quarter minus and seal them in yeah and that's what they did yeah so and that's fair that's and that, that's happened a couple a little out here in the east as well um so yeah exactly exactly uh um 
and you know, uh, this this act defined archaeological resources as at least a hundred years old. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard some estimates be like 150 years old, depending on the archaeologist who talks about it, but whatever. Um, you know, uh, and it can be both a misdemeanor and a felony charge for looting, depending on the severity. Um, yep. You know, including extensive fines, uh, and, you know, it's like you have to have a permit for uh, authorized uh, excavations, like uniform regulations, you have to wear safety gear, all kinds of things. Yep. Uh, curation of archaeological yeah. materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the um, the interesting thing is that all the states also have a requirement that you have to meet in order yep. to get a permit. Yep, that's exactly. And it good. goes so far as if you're like a master's student, yeah, at a university, and this is a project for your master's degree. Yeah, you still cannot get a permit. Your your teacher, your professor, the director of your program is the one yeah. who would be permitted and you would be listed on that permit as a representative. Yeah. The requirements are you have to meet either the experience requirements, you have to be a part of a company, an academic institution, yeah. a government agency, et cetera, so forth, and there is a reason why the work is being done. Yeah. All of your stuff has to be uh, completed as according to um, that state historic preservation office's yep, um, exactly. program. And you do not, repeat, do not get to keep anything. No. <laughs> if you recover materials, if you collect diagnostic artifacts, once your report is complete, those artifacts go to one of three places. I guess four if you want to split hairs. One is the repository that is either run by the the agent, the government agency, or the state. Yep. The and this and this sometimes is the same coin. The academic institution in question, which um, I've had uh, I've had more than a few experiences where that's where the state repository is. Yep. Like, you know, like Arizona. Yeah, uh, there. U of A is the state repository. Same with Arkansas. Or, um, or the uh, the especially with remains and grave goods, they are turned over to the requisite tribe. And if there is no, um, if it's not known who the tribe would be, um, say like in Arizona, the Hoakum as the as a cultural identity is no is doesn't exist anymore. The descendant peoples have become the Hopi and the Navajo, you know, over the course of a thousand years, yep. depending on the tribal agreements between themselves. It depends on where those remains go to be reburied um, in ceremony in a place where they will not be disturbed. Yeah, exactly. The point is, is that nothing goes home with the archaeologist. No, no despite uh, what... Despite what people that we have had personal conversations with will, yeah. would like to claim, like I I will admit fully that there are pieces that I would have loved. Oh yeah, to, to keep. But we don't but, do that. So, <laughs> yeah, you can't. There's yeah. cars that I'd love to drive with the keys sitting in them at the car shows, but I don't drive them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, so yeah. There, there, are, there are like swords and such that I would like to like play with in museums, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna bust the glass open and take the sword out, you know? <laughs> it's like, so yeah, no, it's and that's, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, and then the most important law, and really in my opinion, uh. NAGPRA, or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. the One of the biggest laws that archaeologists in the U.S. have to worry about. Because you do not know, and I've had this mm -hmm. happen before, you do not know when a grave is going to suddenly fucking appear. Yeah. <laughs> and you must literally, I'm not making this up, Archie Wolf can attest to this. You literally, literally have to stop immediately. Like, 
yep. right then and there. Like, literally, drop everything and walk away, and then whoever's the principal archaeologist or whatever has to call and discuss it with the tribe. In question, mm. or tribes. You know, it And can be... sometimes it affects the yeah. actual companies in the sense of, depending on what the permit states, and a you know, in, in the Southwest and the West here, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you still have very large uh, indigenous culture groups, the, you might not be able to do the work on that burial at all. Yeah. As the archaeologist, you have to have a degree or be a professional theologist yeah. who is either contracted or is on staff with the company. And, they are the ones who have to be primary on the burial excavation. Yeah. Um, when I, I uh, one of my earliest projects, I was monitoring a construction project where, you know, I'm standing next to the backhoe, and if, if something came up in the back dirt, I stop the backhoe, I take some pictures, record what I can, and 10 minutes later, get back, let them get back to work. Yeah. Um, pretty much immediately, there was a burial. And the machine had to stop, and every single other worker on the project for a city block had to stop mm -hmm. and go sit in the truck and listen to tunes and sit in the air conditioning. Yeah. And the osteologist for the company I worked for was seven hours out. <laughs> so we had to sit there and do nothing. Yeah. That became, that became a bit of a nightmare for the uh, construction company because it turns out that somebody really failed at the beginning part of the work with the lit search and oh. didn't realize that there was a pioneer cemetery there. Oh, yeah. um, it became quite a big deal. Mm. The uh, <clears throat> um, One of the other things, though, and this also depends, I, I believe, on the group you're working with, you have 24, maybe 48 hours to excavate a burial and that is in every direction a a square meter with no remains yeah uh present even flakes of bone you have 24 to 48 hours to excavate that burial and return it to the tribe yep in the packaged in the manner they they request yeah, yeah. um sometimes the nature of the project they will be understandable. They'll be like, yeah, you know, when you can, because sometimes the project is that extensive. Yeah. Other times, you know, you drop everything, you focus on this one thing, and uh, the construction foreman be damned. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, luckily, I haven't had those scenarios, but I have had where I've had to stop uh, immediately, and we were told by the tribe after we, we found out, because we didn't actually damage anything, we, we just found it, um, it was, and it was actually when we were, like, just sort of finishing up anyway, uh, so the tribe who, who, uh, claimed, um, uh, claimed the area we were doing, the principal archaeologist had, art was already in contact with them, uh, and he talked with them, and they were like, well, did you disturb the burial? And he's like, we disturbed literally a few inches of it, but nothing more. And they're like, just fill it back in. Don't dig in that area ever again. But I've had other, in in the same company I work with, I've had other scenario, people who dealt with similar scenarios to what you're describing. Uh, you know, but usually the tribes were understanding and were like, okay, they said you have 24 hours to... Uh, to excavate, and they allowed them also 24 hours to examine, even. Um, yeah. And then they were like, and then you return it to us. So, which you don't always get that. A lot of times, like Arkham Wolf said, you just, you, you had, it just depends on the tribe. Sometimes they don't want them excavated at all. Sometimes, like we described. Um, and NAGPRA is the second to last sort of law uh written in the U.S. involving archaeology, and it was something that the various Native American nations had to fight for, um, and we'll explain why later on, um, mm -hmm. but 
Uh, it is something that they had to fight for for uh, about a hundred years, uh, and eventually they won out. Uh, and it's literally is everything we describe. You know, it's a human rights law that was enacted in 1990 by uh, I believe it was George uh, Bush Senior. Uh, yeah, by Bush Senior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, where it essentially says, you know, you have to protect and repatriate, uh, uh, human remains, funerary objects, and, uh, sacred objects, and etc., etc., is written on this, uh, slide here, to the tribe, based off of, um, the tribal requirements. Uh, it is not perfect, it could be strengthened, um, but it is, for now, it is the best that they got, and it's the law that we are literally beholden to above all. Above all the other archaeology laws, this is the law we are beholden to. Mm-hmm. I am not exaggerating that at all. That literally. Like, we have to follow all the other laws, and too. And it could be better. Yeah, and it problem. could be better. And that's, yeah. This, I've had more than a few um, of my uh, colleagues who are indigenous saying that this is a band-aid. Yeah, it and is. A band-aid's better than bleeding out, yeah, but yeah. It, it could be better. It needs to address some stuff because yeah. one of the things that it does cover is museum collections Yep. and academic collections, which I'm sure we're going to discuss here in a little bit. Yes. Um, where remains and funerary objects and objects of uh, incredible cultural importance remain in the collections of either museums or universities yes, I, who are supposed to have turned them over. Yep, I can attest to that personally from one of my mentors. So, yes. <laughs> the, that... Um, and, they, and they don't always tell the truth about it either, is the thing. A lot of times these old institutions like the Smithsonian, and no, let me pre- preface this, the Smithsonian no is not hiding any like thing like the Lost Ark or Atlantis or shit like that. But they do lie about cultural artifacts related to Native Americans that they may still have. You know. Because there's this idea, and this is also kind of the um, the devil's advocate statement about things like the British Museum. Yeah. Is that a number of these are these objects would not exist, we would not know about them, if they did not wind up in a museum collection where for all intents and purposes yeah they were protected yeah but uh, for a lot of these things um that wasn't the point of those objects i know that um when the smithsonian had to uh it was either the smithsonian or the or the museum of natural history in new york had to return a number of wooden masks and bowls yeah to one of the larger tribes in the pacific northwest yeah once those objects were back in tribal hands they were immediately destroyed the reason being is those are artif- that those objects were never supposed to survive the burial or the ceremony for the, p- the past individual they were supposed to have been destroyed as a part of that ceremony mm. and they had not been mind that, you these objects had been in those institutions since 1900 so yeah exactly the exact how they were that they they were you know acquired by these institutions um remains up in the air i know locally the university of montana had a very large collection that a good amount is still at the university because the university has the um, the infrastructure and the facility to preserve those things and the Salish wish for them to be preserved. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of the objects that exist there were acquired by one of the uh, town fathers, if you will, of Missoula, who just like anybody who thought they could uh you know ring every single cent out of out of a purchase would go up on the reservation in the winter time and lowball tribal families for important family objects 
because in the winter time food's pretty scarce and if your kids are starving yeah you'll give a grandma's wedding dress kind yeah of exactly exactly um you know and then uh, and then unfortunately some of these were taken after massacres too mm -hmm. um in fact or from uh places like indigenous boarding slash residential schools and again, yep. I'm not. I'm not making this up. Uh, the Vatican, or a company calling itself the Vatican, <laughs> uh, has a website where they're selling these artifacts. Uh, whether or not it's the Vatican it, itself is up for debate, but the site itself states that all funds coming from these sales of these antiques, quote unquote, uh, goes to the Vatican fund. Um, the fund of the literal Vatican itself. They're, it's donated to it. So whether or not the Vatican itself is selling it, a company is claiming to be the Vatican and is donating all the money they get from these the sale of these looted artifacts to, or these artifacts taken from people in areas like boarding schools under duress, uh, the money of that is going to the uh, Catholic Church itself. So, Yeah. <laughs> All in the name of God. Yep. Uh, now we're going to come into Interpol's stance on the looting of artifacts. Um, and this is taken directly from uh, Interpol's uh, website on cultural heritage crime. And it states, Our specialized officers share their expertise and passion for protecting cultural heritage. Since this is a, this is a global phenomenon, it is important that the countries work together. The role of the General Secretariat is primarily to support our member countries and their specialized units in this field. We ensure information is shared among countries and bring experts together in workshops and conferences and offer training. When countries send us information about stolen or trafficked items, we analyze this and enter it into our works of art database. As well as being a central global repository for this information, our experts can also add value to information received. We value emerging trends in art thefts, uh, sorry, we analyze emerging trends in art thefts, uh, such as proliferation of counterfeit, faked, or forged works, or the use of the internet for selling works of dubious background. Many countries do not have police units specializing in cultural heritage property or national databases of stolen items, so we encourage and advise on this to make our global network stronger. Cultural property is part of our heritage, history, and identity, and it needs protecting from criminals. Uh, crafting, uh, trafficking cultural property is a low-risk, high-profit business for criminals with, the, with links to organized crime. Uh, and it can affect all countries, uh, either as origin, transit, uh, origin or transit destinations. So they take it very fucking seriously. <laughs> and then we have the FBI's stance on looting of artifacts, courtesy of the FBI... Uh, the, of the FBI's website, and this is talking about, uh, this article specifically is talking about ISIS's looting of antiquities because that became a massive problem uh, after the Iraq War uh, and also during the Iraq War, uh, where they're talking about how, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, the U.S. has amended uh, the, uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Regulations to reflect new import restrictions on archaeological and ethnological material from Syria pursuant to uh, the Protect, Preserve, International Cultural Property Act. The Federal Register uh, on uh, August 15, 2016 uh, published um, that import restrictions imposed on archaeological and ethnological material in, of Syria includes a list of and it includes a list of and description of object types and categories that are subject to import restrictions and uh and unlawfully removed from syria um and it goes into uh basically everything like what you what will happen like they recognize that while there is a legitimate market for antiquities uh and it is a component of the u.s i.e if antiquities are being sold by the people who say their great great grandfather um, uh, like grandfather clock or, or something like that but the illicit uh, they're asking for help preventing illicitly obtained art and antiquities and again it goes into more that I'm not going to go into uh, but you can see it here uh, so again the FBI takes this shit pretty fucking seriously so yeah so pretty much all across the board 
ar archaeological artifacts are protected by state, federal, uh, state and federal laws, as well as international law. Um, and there are, are and, it, and they take it very, very seriously. Uh, the FBI, in fact, has done raids to retrieve stolen artifacts. So has Interpol. Uh, so, yeah. So there's that. Now, on to the second part, the archaeological method, and how important it is. So, here is the, sort of, a the steps in the archaeological method. Uh, it can vary depending on what, how many steps there are, because sometimes you don't do, uh, say, uh, full-on excavation, as Archie Wolf said earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, that's if you're lucky, uh, but generally things like research questions, research design permits, um, and again, not always laboratory work, it, it, it depends, uh, but the always data analysis, even if it's not taken to the laboratory, um, uh, and then the rest, like publication and curation, it can depend on whether or not you actually do things, mm -hmm. um. But that's generally the steps, is research questions, and permits, and field work, and laboratory work, and analysis, publication, and curation, depending on what you're doing. Yep. So, a uh, hypothesis... And is that for the academic? Did, did you kind of put that with the, ac the academic focus in mind? Uh, I, just sort of, I just sort of looked for, like, the archaeological method on Google, you know? Sure. It's, um, so, again, it can vary depending on if it's, like, uh, commercial uh, archaeology versus academic archaeology as well. Yeah. So, because that is one thing that I think um, we should highlight in this is that academic archaeology and what's called cultural resource management, management yeah. are you know two different bears <laughs> yeah. in the same forest. Yeah, um, academic stuff. You you are doing a lot more focused mm -hmm. research. You are doing a lot more uh, focused data analysis, interpretation. You're doing lab work. Exactly. With with an effort to establish what this stuff is. Yeah. You know, um, to further improve uh, our understanding of the past. Yeah. Um, when it comes to cultural resource management. It's like academic stuff, but you have a two-week window to get everything done. <laughs> yeah, or sometimes a one-week window. <laughs> or a one-week window, or not at all. Yeah, not at like, all. So we don't go into, into a project with research questions so much as what is going to be there based on yeah. the landscape or the history of the area. And that's fair, we too. Don't, we don't want to know how many cans of beans were going to be eaten in 1873 yeah. in a gold camp, gold mining camp. Yeah. We want to know, are we going to find historic stuff? Are we going to find pre-contact stuff? stuff? Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. The research design, that's usually the, uh, that's, that's the project, the entirety of the project itself. Yeah. Survey, exactly. testing, excavation if it's required. Mm-hmm. Uh, curation and preservation of the artifacts, report writing, that has to be condensed into a project mm -hmm. because the cultural resource stuff is money-based. These projects are bid. The project goes to the lowest bidder. Yep. So, and, and you're not there to learn whether or not um, at this time of year this particular object was produced more <laughs> what you're doing is preserving yeah. the information and the data if, and that's where the if we don't have to excavate it if yeah. the project can be modified accordingly um we we modify it accordingly yeah exactly it it also goes into you know turn side of that coin is sometimes the project is so total we have to do a 100% excavation, mm -hmm. which usually is not done. Even if we do an excavation, um, depending on the state you're in, 
it's the minimum is 30 to 40 percent of the site remains intact for posterity sometimes though that doesn't happen yeah and then you have more data analysis and uh laboratory work but again you're not focused on trying to figure something out yeah. you're identifying artifacts you're packaging them up according to uh state or the smithsonian standards yeah and then you're putting that into a report which doesn't get published nope. those reports go into what's called the gray literature or the gray matter and yeah. they are the thing that no one ever reads about mm -hmm. um you have to go to the state or the company that did it and request that site inventory or that uh that that um Report. you know project scope or whatever yeah to figure out what they found and you know the results will be this is what was found this is how this is the artifact assemblage <laughs> what will the project do what will the highway project do to this what's our justification for allowing that to Exactly. And that has to clear the state, that has to clear the company, that has to clear the tribes. It, Unlike academic stuff, you also get to return, depending on the scale of that project, you get to return every year. CRM, yeah. we don't do that. Yep. So. And that's, that's very true. And uh, sometimes you're sent out to an area that's already been fucked over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. And that... Here's something that's that because I know there's going to be people watching this just to uh, screech about it. This stuff, the the going out to where places have already been damaged or looted. Yeah. Though that those activities damage the site integrity. Yep. Some places that people enjoy in the outdoors for recreation, places that people find culturally important to them. And everybody has a cultural importance to something. If there's a spot on the river where you used to fish with your grandfather, mm -hmm. that's a culturally important site to you. Yep. If there is no site integrity on these places, that is the death knell for those places surviving. Yep. The place, not just the site. If you go onto a, if you go into an area where the highway is going through, <laughs> And there's a site there that has been completely torn up and picked over by looters. Yeah. But it's right next to your favorite duck hunting pond or, you know, uh, the, the, uh, place where you hunt whitetail or whatever. Yeah. The highway department doesn't care about nope. your duck hunting or your camping or your picnic days. They'll put a bulldozer right through the middle of it. Yes, And they the will. thing that would have changed that project is because a site was there and there was a reason to preserve it. Yep. And that's and yeah. you know. Yeah, and then also also another thing that we saw recently, oh, they already know uh they they already they they deem the site un unnecessary to excavate at because they already know about that time that period. That's not how that absolute that's absolute lie. That's not how that works. I just addressed that in my latest TikTok. That is not how that is yeah. not how this job works. Same here. And yeah. I will tell you, this is how ridiculous it is out west here. A lot of the archaeological assemblage out west, because most of the tribes were mobile. Yeah. Most of the sedentary large deposits of human material culture are not indigenous. They're Euro American. Yeah. If I'm at a site where I have to pay attention to the number of broken glass bottles and half-rusted bean cans and bent nails and keep a bulldozer from driving over those because those are culturally significant according to the law, yep. you can be damn sure that an indigenous site on this continent is protected and is not something we go, oh, this isn't important. Yeah. Well, it's like, I don't I, know where they come up with that bit yeah, of imagination. I don't either. Well, like but, I, uh, I addressed it too because it, like the you can type into Google search or as I did uh, as I looked at also a, a book of archeo of uh, different archaeological papers. Uh, the 
Like, you can type into Google search or look in one of those books about any time period, whether it be, um, say, the Mississippian period or mm -hmm. uh, the pre-ceramic period of, of whatever culture. And you can probably find, like, 90 different papers, sometimes more, you know, at least four sometimes, papers yeah. on those things. That's doesn't... that. That shows that it doesn't matter <laughs> if we know I, about that I, time period. I addressed this in a different video, in a different format as to why the question came up. But I, I put it this way. We know what happened in history. We have a coloring book, if you will. Mm -hmm. Black and white line work. We know what happened. Every single archaeological discovery is a colored pencil or a marker or a crayon that adds color yeah. to the past. Or it it's a paints that dot. picture. Yeah. Or so the, yeah. when, like this kid, we're discussing from yeah. Florida, I know because we're talking about the same person. Yeah, we are. Goes and digs up this site. Not only did he dig up a burial site because of the nature of the artifact he was finding. To say that that site wouldn't be important is absolute is absolute trash yeah it's not because how it works. maybe you know i mean maybe and this is me being the the cold archaeologist looking at everything science like if we the professionals for whatever reason had to dig up that space and we found not just one individual say a dozen even though you know, and this, and again, this is me being the bad guy for the sake of the, co of the conversation. Yeah. Everything we could learn from that material would color in our picture of, of the history of that region. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how important this is. So when someone says, oh, you guys <laughs> looked at it and then decided it wasn't important... Well, That's an admission did. of guilt. Yeah. Period. The end. Yeah. And it, I think the I think what they might be confusing it with is what I said earlier. If we can avoid digging, digging it up, it up. Yeah. we do. Which which is even more um, admitting guilt. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's it's yeah, and and if the archaeologists, even if a project goes through, even if a project is completed and the sites do not get excavated because of you know cultural concerns or hey it's just not required you yeah. don't have to do a site excavation for a timber sale you know just because we don't does not mean those sites are exempt from the law mm -hmm. that's exactly you know and it. i we did we the archaeologists did not make the law nope. ironically enough the law was made by politicians yeah they talked to us they got some ideas but they're the ones who put it through mm -hmm. and it does not remove it does just because we don't excavate the site for whatever reason we have in our reports and remember we're the professionals <laughs> who understand the reason Hell, we gave that as the mitigation. Yeah. What should the project end with? This site can be avoided. Yep. Avoid it. Just because we don't dig it up does not mean that those laws that have been in place for 100 years at least, well, 120 years almost at this point, and based on states, sometimes earlier, because I think, uh, what was it? One of one of the states, I want to say maybe Kentucky or something, mm -hmm. has some of the earliest laws from like the 1870s. Um, just because we don't excavate it does not mean those sites are not protected. Yeah. Just because I don't shoot a deer during hunting season does not mean you can poach that deer. Exactly. Well, and then also, literally, what that is. Yeah. Also, to expand on that, like by that same logic. Okay. Well, um, Cahokia, 
has already been looked at. Or uh, here in Georgia, the Etowah Mounds has already been looked at. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Monticello has already been looked at. You know, by that same fucking lot. Uh, Pompeii has already been looked at. And that's not in the U.S., but, I mean, might as well Whoa. include it. You know, so by that logic, why continue excavations there? Which is, like, not how archaeology works. If you, mm. if you have... You know, if one of your CRM, you know, if you're, if you know about it, you know, and it's, and you have to do it for a job, you have to do it for a job, or if you're in academia, if you have a fucking research question, mm -hmm. you can go back there. You know, there are multiple different ways. Or in CRM, if you didn't do enough at a previous yeah. site, then you will, I've had to do that. Where I've had yeah, to, where I've been here. told, hey, uh, the per the last guy didn't do enough at this area. I need you and such and such to go out and finish it up. Or uh, uh, another coworker of mine had that happen a couple weeks ago. Like, hey, at this site, such and such, and no, uh, we're not ever gonna give s sites. Sorry, no. uh, there's we're the the reasons for that are what we're talking about now. But anyways, but they said, hey, hey Michael you and such and such need to go out to this site because not enough was done at that site. So, that's not how that works. You, you know, and, it, and it, you know, uh, so yeah, and to sort of jump off on that and continue that, you know, uh, research questions or, you know, um, project, uh, project plans or what have you are why we look at places and this is a good example of sort of a research question that archaeologists sort of use uh this is from a paper um uh in mongolian archaeology and it's taking a look at like uh, it's taking a look at the microliths or the microblades of a specific site and they had a question like okay well what were they using them for how can we test that uh and what does that use where in the in what they were using for tell us about how they lived or or something like that um some you have to have some form of research question or some for, or a form of project plan at the very beginning to before you begin anything mm -hmm. so then there are various ways you can uh archaea wolf i know you know this very well <laughs> this type of mm -hmm. method very well uh but there then you then there are various ways you can jump off and begin uh archaeological work um a lot of times uh not always but a lot of times it begins with uh surface collection or surface survey because again it's not always collecting uh archaea wolf can again attest to this where basically you and a whole bunch of people uh with a map, whether it be paper or digital, uh, are going through an archaeological site or a proposed archaeological site or a proposed work site or what have you, uh, and you're examining the surface. And it can take a long time because, yeah, you pretty much have to, I've had to do this too, you pretty much have to stop and take a look at every little tiny shadow or, right. or flake or thing that might be a piece of pottery or whatever and examine it. And it can be tiring. But it's also a very good way to um, determine if something's an archaeological site. In fact, one of my bosses wrote a dissertation on the importance of surface survey and surface collection in finding archaeological sites. So, yeah. Uh, Archaeo, well, why don't you explain some of your experiences doing this? You know, just to... Uh, well, so some of the... So, because I work for a government agency... Um, we do predominantly this survey. Um, mo most of my office, I always say, is in the Montana backcountry. Yeah. These are not places that are going to be developed. These are not places that you're doing oil survey on. I mean, our, our field truck can barely get into some of these places. <laughs> but because these places do see use... These are where uh, mining leases go. These are where timber leases and timber sales go. We have, because of the laws we talked about at the beginning, we have an obligation to go out there and culturally survey all of it. Now, some of the stuff I've done is in right in the face of the project, and the machines are breathing down my neck. Some of the things we've done, they don't implement their project for six years. Yeah. You know, uh, prescribed burns. 
we have to mitigate because not only do you have indigenous artifacts that are made of stone, you have culturally modified trees. Um, I know we have we have uh, an assemblage of what is considered culturally modified trees here, and a lot of these old pines still exist. I don't know if uh, that's pretty that's you know prevalent down where you are, but we do have this concern of wooden cultural things that will be damaged in a prescribed burn. I mean, we definitely Historic have wooden buildings, buildings, a, yeah. stuff like that. Um, and we walk transects. We yep. we spread out. Um, Montana, and the the Montana requirement is twenty meters apart at max. Yeah. Where you walk a pattern through an area to to uh, locate cultural resources, and yeah, we're looking the surface. A lot of places you have to do what's called a shovel test. Mm-hmm. I'll, and I'll get to that. We don't do that here. We don't do those here. Um, we, because we work so closely with the tribe and we have such a, we have such a, I mean, cause the Salish, uh, reservation is 15 miles north of my house here. Mm. The, the, uh, department I work for a lot of the land in our district is adjacent to Salish reservation. Mm. It is all traditionally culturally important land. There is nothing here that was not part of their territory or their region of occupation for thousands of years. We do a lot of consultation with them on this stuff. Uh, again, they, they, you know, shovel tests are not required. Yeah, exactly. Um, sometimes we will go through and we will find nothing. <laughs> Believe me, I have gone miles and miles and miles and found not a single thing. Mm -hmm. But the moment the prescribed burn goes through, we start finding can dumps from mining projects. We do find features like trails yeah. that, or ditches or stuff like that. Ground features that wouldn't be disturbed by something like a fire, but they will be disturbed by a bulldozer. Mm -hmm. Those get recorded as well. So this is, it's not just artifacts. We should, we should cover that. It's not just nope. artifacts that are archaeologically and culturally important. Um, everything from a building foundation to an irrigation ditch to, there's a great example of one, a stack rock wall yep. that goes straight up a mountainside. It looks like the strangest thing. Who would build a rock wall there? Well, the Shoshone would when they're hunting bighorn sheep. Yeah. It's a drive line. So we have uh, geologic or uh, geographical archaeology, which looks at human modification of the landscape. Yep, exactly. Those things are considered culturally important. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, so, but just like in this picture here, we'll go walking. Yeah. And we'll sometimes find stuff. We'll sometimes not. Yeah. And that's exactly Depending on what state you're in, because I know it's different between the states, what you find dictates what is considered a site. Yep. I can tell you that I don't know how how everybody's how spread out everybody is in this picture. They kind of, kind of look close. You could have a site immediately in front of the woman in the right middle of the page. Yeah. Because in Montana, it's five artifacts of an indigenous origin constitute a site. Oh, really? One feature constitute a site. Really? Historically, it, 25 artifacts constitutes a site huh. or a feature like a cabin. You know? Yeah. Then you have to establish the extent of that site. Is it 30 foot square? Is it 60 foot square? There's a site that if we actually wanted to put them together, we could have one site that's quarter mile wide and three and a half miles long. Yeah. Because it follows a landform. Yeah. And we have numerous sites all the way through. But I guarantee you, if there was a grass fire through there, we could walk from one end to the other of that ridgeline, and we wouldn't be able to walk a foot or two before we found something. Um, 
the, the state requirements are different, but just because, I mean, just because it is a small scatter of something does not mean that it constitutes a site. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Especially considering one of one of the criteria for protection under the historic or the um, National Historic Preservation Act is Criterion D, and that is the potential for data. Yeah. It's not worded that way, but it's essentially that the potential for information. Yeah. If we're not doing shovel tests, that's anybody's guess. So if we have five artifacts on the surface, it's protected. Well, it's protected anyway, but it's yeah. that site qualifies for the National Register if it's an indigenous site. Mm -hmm. If it's historic, it's looked at with a little bit more blasé, you know, <laughs> because it's historic, and if you've seen one bean can, you've seen them all. Yeah. yeah. But even in those situations, yeah, the bean cans don't matter, but that cabin was built in such a fashion that you only see that cabin in Finland. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that. We have cabins and structures built here in Montana that because they were built by a migrant from Finland or Sweden or Norway, they exhibit those particular features because that individual knew how to cut a, a, a dovetail Norwegian cabin joint. <laughs> And that's they put their cultural knowledge into practice. Yeah. If that's the only structure that's still standing in the area, that's significant. And sometimes those Norwegian cabins are because they're actually held together. The the ones built by, you know, somebody come out from New York to make his <laughs> make his money, they don't last much very no. long at all because they just fall over. Yeah. But there's I've seen some of these that there's trees pushing up one side of the cabin <laughs> off the ground. And the cabin is still square. <laughs> it's not square on the ground, but it's square three quarters of the way up in the air. Wow. Because the the jointing is so tight. Yeah. Because that is such a distinct cultural feature that's traced back to thousands of years of figuring out that that kind of carpentry in Europe with that tr that resource you know uh, pine trees yeah that is a that can be a significant thing and a rare thing I would a lot imagine. of things <laughs> a lot of things and I know this this might this this will this is kind of one of those assimilation things that happens in any country that has a large migrant population yeah uh, knowledge like that if it's not used does not get passed on mm-hmm and, and it's something true. as small as if a if a guy from Finland marries a woman from Ireland. Yeah. If there's no reason to teach his half Irish kids this particular skill, he won't. Yeah. And he's the only one with that skill. Mm -hmm. And when he dies, it's gone. Yep. Yeah. So some happens. of these some of these distinctly cultural um, features or aspects of a site they only exist because of one person so it's important if those sites can be protected to protect them if the sites can't be protected or can't be preserved you still protect them yeah the exactly. information component is still there mm -hmm. so exactly yeah and we do in, in in the back here in the east we do the same thing uh though to be fair my company has a historic uh, division like a, a history division so a lot of times buildings like that are under the jurisdiction of that section of my company but mm -hmm. whatever understandable. D d apples and oranges at that point okay so now we're in my bread and butter <laughs> um, I want to say something what real quick uh-huh there's a, do you have a fence post hole here everybody take a look at that board that is the bare minimum of data that is collected for yes. a fence post hole. Yes, I know. Well, I harp on provenience and site data all the all time. All the fucking time, yeah. There, it, there, there might be nothing in that hole, and there's still data for an empty hole. Yeah. Because it is a part of the archaeological process. Well, 
actually, so so let me correct you on this. This is not a fence post haul. I'm being facetious, I know. This is a shovel test. So, my bread and butter. So, in the, at least in the east, in the in eastern woodlands, or the southeast, or what have you, what archaeologists, when, especially in CRM firms, though a lot of academic archaeologists use this too because it's a good tool to sort of determine if something's actually a site or not, you know, uh, we walk in, a tra in transects, um, uh, sometimes 10 meters, sometimes 20 meters, sometimes 30, sometimes even 100 meters apart. And then at every point on a grid that I'll show in a second, we stop and we dig a hole like this. Uh, sometimes only uh, sometimes only 10 centimeters down, sometimes over 100 centimeters down, depending on, uh, and I'm, 100 centimeters sounds like a lot, but when you're digging in sand that is in a floodplain, you're, it's going to take you a while to get to the, to the subsoil. Um, so yeah, and we dig it, and we, you know, we, uh, st uh, we mark, uh, every, uh, artifact we find in every strat, you know, stratums one, two, etc., 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 and then afterwards, uh, we don't always take a picture, but a lot of times, if we want sort of like uh, a picture that is a rep representative of what the soil uh, color, yes, color is very important to archaeology in terms of soil and color and texture, color. texture as well, texture. Uh, and we, you know, and we dig down and we uh, take a picture of this uh, and, and you need a board that is showing where north is uh, sometimes you need a scale there are various different si scale sizes and you need uh, at least the bare minimum the name of the street as well as like um, who's working on this area the, the coordinates etc etc and then you take the picture um, and so, shovel tests are done in grids uh, on transects, uh, and so how it works both for CRM and for academia, uh, you look at how many shovel tests are positive, i.e. you found an artifact or artifacts in it. Sometimes you get, and this is what we most of the time run into, uh, sometimes you get jack and shit where you find one shovel test or two shovel tests, uh, actually three shovel tests is what happened with, with my most recent project, uh, but what, but whatever, sometimes you find one or two or three shovel tests that have an artifact, and then you have 50 or more that are none, that have no artifacts in them. Um, in that case, it would not be an archaeological site, uh, because it's like, okay, well, we found one flake, and so therefore it, it's, it could be natural, who knows. Um, and then, if it's positive, uh, so on this map, to clarify, um, the reds are negative and the greens are positive, so this would constitute as a site. So if there's a whole bunch of positive shovel tests that are grouped together, like on this map, then you probably have an archaeological site. And then, depending on whether you're doing it for academia, you know, we, we've already talked about, you know, research questions and things like that. Uh, but if it's for CRM, then it's like, okay, what do we do? Do we, uh, we, we, either way, we have to report it to the company who has to report it to the owner and the state and et cetera, et cetera. And then we figure out, it's like, well, are we going to have to excavate it and move on to, a, say, a phase two, which is uh, what generally is like the actual excavation units and then, or, and then eventually a phase three, which is that even more. Or do we try to usually, like Archibald said, usually it, results in moving the project area a little bit, uh, or um, any number of things that we've already mentioned. Uh, this is essentially what a phase two looks like. Uh, these are what archaeological units look like. They're on grids that can range anywhere between, like, say, a 4x12 or a 4x20 or a 4x4, um, and you dig every say every sometimes usually it's like 10 centimeters um sometimes it can be less sometimes it can be more depending on your specialty i know historic archaeologists uh and battlefield archaeologists do it like by millimeters which i can only imagine how long that takes 
because uh, I've never actually had to do that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and we look at the... When we're doing this, we don't just look at the artifacts. This is going to the provenience thing that, that uh, mm -hmm. Archeowulf and literally every archaeologist, myself included, harp on. Uh, we look at everything. We look at the, str uh, the stratigraphy or the layers of the soil. Like, the top layer being the most recent modern ground surface, and then, like, the, and, th and this is, this, this is, I have another picture of stratigraphy that is more indicative of what you usually come across. This is the golden ratio. Archaeologists rarely come across stratigraphy that's like this. Yeah, very, it's very never rarely. this clean. It's never this clean, but this is, like, what it... You might find it that's clear. Yeah. You but might clean. It. Yeah. Is no. different. Yeah, exactly. So, but but you know, you know stratigraphy as it as it should be based off of how nature work nature originally works, um, is you, you know, and I don't know why I was doing air air quotes for that. I, how nature is supposed to work and does actually work, sort of, um, is you know, strat A is the youngest, and then strat B is the next youngest, and then strat C is, etc. Uh, etc. Et all the way down to the oldest, which is the deepest. And that's how what archaeologists are looking for. However, <laughs> it's rarely that simple. Oh, this is this one is a great one. This I one is this. a great one, yeah. So these are like this is how archaeology actually looks because you're like, oh, what's so what's the what's the oldest? So generally, uh, it goes um, one and two, and then. Both of these down here count as three, and then this is four, uh, and then five, and then yeah. six, and then these, uh, th this includes six, and then these up here actually can, uh, go to different levels themselves. Like this Roman wall actually goes up to four, uh, or sorry, five, whatever, you get the idea. The point is they, they yeah, the blend take away. together. Yeah, they blend is together. That this is not a breeze. There is multiple things yeah. that impacts multiple other things, which is why thoroughly recording, recording the find yeah. of an artifact or artifacts during an excavation is, is important. so important. Because one of like, the things that I... oh no, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. One of the things I do want to point out on this one is a good example. You have at the very bottom, you have natural subsoil. Yeah. In other uh, depend, depending on where you are, I don't know if, if you if you refer to it as this name. We refer to that as sterile. Yeah, sterile. Yeah. There's nothing human there. Mm hmm You know, sterile is the oldest. Sterile is when you're getting into, you know, uh, uh, you know, mammoths that never had to be bothered with humans. Yeah. Except if you notice there is human activity that intrudes on yeah. the sterile. And that's and that's is... why most excavations, whether they be academic or CRM, have requirements of you going at least ten centimeters into mm -hmm. the sterile slash subsoil yep. to double check. <laughs> yep, you absolutely have to do that. And in some I mean I've worked on some projects, you either the you go to sterile soil or bedrock. Because in some places you know, you wipe the dirt off, and you're at the rock, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. But bedrock the... impasse. So, yeah. So, yeah, and that's exactly how this works. And, like, and like post holes. Post holes, like you're going back to where we are talking about post holes. Post holes can sometimes go through multiple different layers. And so you're yep. having to, you're having to, like, sort of sit there, and depending on the size, some are, like, um an inch wide some are bigger so depending on what you're doing you're sitting there in the trench scraping out with not a shovel usually usually with your trowel even in crm mm -hmm. uh you're scraping that post hole out with a trowel trying to figure out where it ends uh yep. and it takes a while it and then does. sometimes sometimes uh and this is you know uh you uh huh. You come across a buried structure where the structure goes across, also goes across multiple different layers. So it's like, okay, well, when the fuck was this built? Did some guy dig this crap in here, or was it 
built and then stuff piled in it or you know who knows that's why you need to record everything and that's why mm -hmm. things like uh um was it uh crap uh, not arbitrary dating uh relative dating uh that's why yeah. relative dating of artifacts like pottery and lithics or uh any other diagnostic artifact whether it be like an iron nail or what have you is important that's why things like carbon dating uh radiometric dating um are important as well you have to record everything uh stratigraphy is rarely that picture perfect stratigraphy from two slides ago it's usually these most recent slides that we look at you know <laughs> stratigraphy is a dating method that has to correspond with, with the a artifact. bunch of other information yeah that shows that it's correct yeah exactly you know you, you cannot um, rely only on stratigraphy you can't rely only on any of this stuff actually that's true you have if to you rely find on all a, of it a stratigraphic layer that let's let's just give it an arbitrary number is 500 years old mm -hmm. and you find a selection of stone tools that are indicative of that region 500 years ago yeah and some pottery that's indicative of that culture 500 years ago yeah it's it's a pretty safe bet you're looking at a 500 year old, year old site. thing yeah now, something that would throw you off that you would then have to look at other data is you're looking at 500-year-old stuff, and then suddenly there's a 200-year-old mm. piece of pottery. The reason that might be there is because of bioturbation, a rodent burrow passing through, um, a tree growing up, yep. ant hill being in place where it pulls stuff up and they pull stuff down. Moles. Moles. You then have to look at a number of other things to confirm that. Yeah. One of which is, yes, the soil. You can identify a rodent burrow based on the color of the soil yeah. and the compaction of the soil. Mm -hmm. You know, if the ground's been in a packed condition for 500 years and a rabbit dug a burrow last week and filled it in, that dirt is going to be obviously different. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, and you know, or or charcoal, something burnt there, like burnt wood, you know, that's another thing, you know, and you have to determine it's like, okay, well, was this like, say, uh, lightning struck a tree here that's only been here for say sixty years or so, or is it a post hole, or was it a fire pit, you know, like was mm -hmm. it a post that got burnt down? You know, you have and you have to look at all of the data to determine this. You can't just look at one single thing. Again, despite what a lot of looters would like to claim. Yeah, when I was in, uh, I was working on a project in Queen Creek, Arizona, and it was one of the most beautiful sites that I have had a chance to work on, honestly. Mm -hmm. And because it was CRM, we used a backhoe to dig a trench. Yeah. People can cringe. I cringe. Yeah. But in the wall of this trench mm -hmm. was the edge of a pit house mm -hmm. that had plaster floors. <laughs> and it had multiple plaster floors. Mm -hmm. what, it had, what was the cultural uh, practice at the time is you'd live in a house for like a decade or maybe two. And then you burn it down. Oh, interesting. And you rebuild it. On the same spot, essentially. All the stuff collapses in the middle. You fill it in. You pack it down. There's your floor. And then you build a new pit house. Um, so you could see every single burn of it mm -hmm. in this pit house that dated back, I think, to about 900. Oh, okay. Um, it, was, it was amazing. One of the things that was really interesting about it, as opposed to some of the other pit houses that were right nearby and again this shows why the tribe is on speed dial that pit house did not have any burials in the floor and this is at the time period where it was a cultural thing to bury your dead in the floor the other pit houses that were discovered adjacent to it i mean within a couple hundred feet they did have burials in the floor they were old enough to still have wood in the Phoenix Basin in order to cremate remains. Oh, okay. So they were not full 
temple burials, they were cremated burials. That gave an age almost immediately. Oh, really? Yeah, because... Uh, and again, this, this shows how other disciplines work together. Mm-hmm. Pollen counts yeah. in the soil at a particular time period show what is essentially the die-off event for yeah. wood woody trees in the Phoenix Basin. Mm-hmm. The reason for that is people. Trees were harvested for building material. They were harvested for crafting material, and they were harvested for fuel. Yeah. And that was at a time period where you could, not to say, not to make this sound cold, but waste the wood on something that was not necessarily relevant to your survival. Yeah. So, cremating a set of remains. Yep. When that surplus of fuel goes away, you then have to look at, well, do we do this cultural thing? Or do we heat the food? Yeah. Do we build the house? So, exactly. that is a cultural change brought on by a resource loss or environmental change because say you know the it goes into a drought that it doesn't rain worth a damn for 10 years breaking that monsoon dry monsoon dry cycle yeah exactly if you can if other um, disciplines like botany or wildlife bio yep um, or hydrology in some cases with, with uh, sedimentary layers and everything, if they can yeah. say, well, between 1100 and 1150, there was a drought event, and you have a point within that window where they change a practice, say they, used, they moved from using one wood to make an artifact to a different wood, that might not be as good, but it can survive in drier conditions, mm. you can see where they had to make a change in there every day based on a climate event that took away a resource. Yeah. Or in the case of where you see this change in burial tradition, where the the resource is, uh, out, the, the use of the resource outstrips the resource's ability to replenish it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or, say, overhunting. Yeah. You know. Um, that, cause that, overhunting you know, is a great example. Yeah. Uh, zo- zo- there's a reason that there's a subfield of archaeology called zooarchaeology. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> or zoologists in general. So, yeah. You know, not to, not to jab too much, but you would think someone who's a, uh, who works for a fishing charter would understand what happens if you overfish someplace. Yeah. 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 Not being snide at all, but totally being snide. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so after this, a lot of this excavation process, processes, um, you already sort of saw this in the test pit picture. But again, in general, overall archaeology, you have to photograph everything. Yep. Everything. And this, I, I chose this picture because it, it it really shows sort of the weird positions archaeology have to, archaeologists have to get in to take these pictures, you know, yep. where like he's having to like stand oblique on one area with his legs spread just so he can get the good picture. Uh, some people have had to, I'm not making this up, put ladders in the back of pickup trucks and step to the top oh, of the yeah. ladders so they could take that. Uh, I've had to lean across. In weird angles across a trench to take a picture of something, you know, uh, an excavation unit. Um, sometimes they're called trenches, sometimes they're called excavation units. It just depends on the archaeologist. Anyways, um, it just, it, you know, I it you have to do these things. It depends on light a lot too. Like you, a lot of times you're ha- sitting. Sometimes you're sitting there having to hold up a, a tent to block the sunlight yep. out because it's so bright you can't look at the feature. Like in this picture, you can barely see it. There's sort of like a, an artifact, uh, possibly like an iron knife or something. I'm not exactly sure, but it's right here in the by the arrow, uh, which is what he's taking a picture of. And, you, the, and that's what you have to do. You have to take a picture of it in situ is what we call it. 
you know, in the its original spot. Uh, and yep. you, you, and there's the scale I was talking about um, that you put right there to sort of show how large the artifact or artifacts or how large the feature or features are. Um, you know, the arrow pointing to north and then the the uh, board with all of the information, side info, mm-hmm. um, the date, the level, the unit, uh, the quadrant of the unit a lot of times, um, what the artifact is, and then everyone who wor- who's working in the area. Sometimes a lot more than that. Uh, the coordinates, you know, uh, it just depends. Uh, but it's a lot of information you have to have on that, and you have to photograph everything. The idea is, and this was told to me uh, when I was still in uh, doing my undergrad work, but yeah. the amount of information that you are expected <laughs> slash wanted to take yeah. is, and, be, and this is because there are numerous projects in the past that did not yeah. do this. You want to take enough notes and enough information that someone 50 years down the line <laughs> can look at your notes and recreate what you found. Yes, clap, clap, clap. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and even if it's, I mean, devil's advocate, you can't record absolutely everything photo perfect, but you should be able to look at the notes if you have the notes available or, like with a site form, it's, that information should be in the site form. Yeah. So someone can look at the site form and look at the site in question and go, at this datum point, which is a fixed point from where people measure everything yeah. on the site, and sometimes you have multiple datums, too. Yep. From this fixed point, this knife was found... 15 meters away. Yep. Uh, you, you know, 30 centimeters down. Here's the color of the soil. Here's the grain of the soil. <laughs> yeah. It was oriented. The artifact itself was oriented, you know, northwest to southeast. Yep. Here's a picture that corresponds with that information and the date it was taken and all of the other information that shows that. So you have this big puzzle that, I mean, you might not be able to go back to that site, period, yeah. the end. But you can then, you can still put together a picture of what's there. Exactly. This is, and because others have used this analogy, and I've used it, yeah. this is the same sort of detail work and data recovery that is done at a murder scene. Yep. That's exactly This is the it. same sort of crime scene data collection because you know let's pretend he's taking picture of the murder weapon Mm -hmm. if somebody came in and picked that up before he took a picture of it the person who stabbed whoever is going to go free because now you cannot say with a reason without a reasonable doubt that that knife was actually where it was yeah you know that might be the difference between uh, somebody going to free, somebody going to jail. Yeah. You know, um, the the position of things is so incredibly important. They show it on the, on, you know, the, the CSI and everything, mm-hmm. you know, quickly to the hip-hop lab where they have the bubbly beakers. <laughs> you still are looking at data that corresponds to other data. The body was found here. Mm-hmm. If the body was found here, how could the window open? There must have been someone else in the room. Yeah, exactly. That is the kind of detail that plays off of other details that allows us to reconstruct a site. Because you got you, you do have to remember is that these sites are broken. Mm. We're not looking at something perfect. We're looking a sometimes, you know, you put a model airplane in a box and you shake the shit out of it. <laughs> you now have a broken airplane. Yeah. You know that it's an airplane. You know that it's a cabin, whatever but you still have all of these pieces that are not necessarily where they would be normally. Yeah, exactly. In order to figure that out, you have to collect all of the data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly it. And it's it, it, it like it, it, and thank you for bringing up the people in the past didn't leave enough information. 
I mm. ran into that personally for my for a paper I just submitted a, a, a couple of months ago uh, for publishing when I was doing research for it. Or I like try track down this interview that an archaeologist who had worked worked previously on the site that I was re doing the research for in the fifties, and in the interview, the only which is the only information that he had before my uh, the principal archaeologist that I'm working with on the project uh, right now, who who went back and excavated it in 2010. Before that, uh, before he did that. This guy was the only one who dug there, and in that interview, the only source that we have about his excavation, all he says is, oh, I found some chert and a couple of pieces of pottery. Not where, oh, yeah. not, not what level, <laughs> you know, no features. I've, <laughs> I've had to relocate sites that were uh, recorded, like, in the 70s. Yeah. And the only thing I have to go on as to what I'd be looking for is... Flake stone. Yeah. And it's just like, no, okay. no points, <laughs> no stone type, no orientation. Yeah. Nothing. Exactly. The, there's, there's, there's not even a description of how to, how you got there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, take highway exit 210, drive six miles, turn left. Yeah. Onto what? Onto what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like what road? Yeah, exactly. You know, and that is something that, you know, in some of these areas, yeah, in 1972, there, there's no other road for six miles until yeah. you get to that point. But in 2020, yeah. there's three roads within 100 yards of each other mm -hmm. that are at the six-mile mark. Yeah, exactly. Which one do you turn on? Yeah, so exactly. So... The need for accurate data collection is immense. It's immense. Which also... And we... Well, we Go can, can, no, you can say what you're saying. I was going to say, we archaeologists, I want to say in the last 40 years... Uh -huh. And I'm saying 40 years because I, I'm realizing what 40 years ago is. Yeah. We are... The, the practice has really sunk in on... on the detail that's needed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, especially in CRM. Yeah. Because I think, I think, um, I'd be willing to say that academic archaeology has done this uh, since the 18, 1870s. Yeah. Well, where you have, because there is an act, well, let me finish. Because <laughs> there is an institution of higher learning involved <laughs> and somebody's name is involved uh like um what's his name the guy who died in the mosquito bite bank oh, carter uh, carter or something yeah yeah uh cabin cavendish or lord lord carnarvon carnarvon yeah carnarvon yeah the reason one of the reasons why so much data was recorded even though it you, you know some of it was some of the stuff that we would record today was not recorded then. Mm. You're still looking at a rather extensive amount of work. Yeah. Whereas with cultural resource management, it's a lot more. It was a lot more. It, 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 here's the meat and potatoes. No fixins. Yeah. Don't drive here. Yeah. And that was all they needed to do. Yeah. Exactly. So. Exactly. Though, like, what I was going to say is, like, that also depends because, again, going back on what I just talked about, the, the guy I was trying to track down the, the, the source for, he was academic. He was, he worked with UGA. So, oh, so, no. I know. Well, I so, never said everybody was perfect. No. Well, no. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, you know, go, going, can, jumping off of that, like, the need for detail, that, that need for detail has actually led to the development of other tools that have been used to actually make archaeology better better uh such as uh lidar uh mm -hmm. which you see here where basically it's it's some it's a drone or sometimes a plane sometimes it's a guy just driving a plane but a lot of times nowadays it's a drone and it flies over this field and it has a grid that you sort of see here uh, of lasers and other things involved um and they're used very skillfully to make it to take pictures of things that are either under dense forest or underground or what have you, uh, based off of the 
geography itself, like uh, the elevations and uh, things like that, and you're able to find things hidden under the soil or the trees or what have you, uh, such as Maya cities, like this one that was found via LIDAR, I think, last year, I want to say. Yeah, um, this is I, this this is like the six hundred and fifty acre complex. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. a massive complex. Uh, they found using lidar. You also have the sort of cousin of lidar, uh, GPR, where it's basically yeah. the it's sort of not quite, but it's like it's. it's well, let me rephrase this. It's, is, it's more like the cousin of, of of magnetometry, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you basically send a a little robot, or you're walking and doing it yourself, or as I've done before, you drive in a say a uh, golf cart or uh, an ATV or something like that, holding the damn thing up, doing it, uh, and you send the and you send it uh, across the ground, and it takes uh, readings every after every determined set, whether it be every ten meters or five meters or what have you. Um, similar to LiDAR in terms of the grid part, uh, also magnetometry, uh, and once you're done done doing that, you can oftentimes find structures buried, that were either destroyed or buried deep underground, like this historic structure you see here. Um, and also, the, is, is Archie Wolf brought up in one of his videos, uh, it's important to know how to make a map. This is in meters. So, like, Five, yeah. ten, etc. Meters, or sometimes miles or kilometers or what have you, um, to show the size. Scale is always important too. But yeah, so this is a tool that has helped archaeologists find things that maybe they don't necessarily want to or need to dig, but they can still record that it's there, and it can still help um, determine the how projects go. Can help determine research. They. I mean, I don't want to say the possibilities are limitless because it, they they do have limits, but they're they are very helpful to archaeology, both in CRM and in academic. So once we do those methods, whether we do surface collection or I'm having uh, flashbacks, uh, or um, uh, what'd you say? I'm having I'm having uh, traumatic flashbacks with all them little pieces on the table that are not diagnostic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyways, but you know, whether it be surface collection or uh, shovel tests or full-blown excavations or you're using LIDAR or GPR or magnetometry, which is similar to li uh, to a GPR, where you, which I've also done, where you have this little square box thing that you have to hold and you walk on a grid uh, and you... You know, it takes a picture every five, ten, etc. meters, and then you repeat that process over a massive field, uh, and that you really do have to walk. Um, or you can take long cords and you can roll them across a field and nail spikes into them uh, and run electricity through that, and that can help you determine what's under the ground. All kinds of things. So once you do all of that, the next thing, both in CRM, if you've actually done the digging, uh, and in academia, mm -hmm. is you take the shit to the lab, and you analyze it, uh, whether it's to just determine what it is and put it in a repository, uh, or you're actually analyzing it for research. And this is generally, not always, sometimes archaeological labs, like the lab at the company I work at looks way different than this, uh, <laughs> but so a lot of times they do sort of look like this. Uh, and this is where a bulk of the archaeological archaeological work is done. Is in either in doing, reading the research materials or in the lab. Um, and here in the lab, you re you analyze things like uh, one of the things that I'm going uh, going to school to specialize in lithic analysis. Uh, yeah, lithic analysis, uh, where you look at uh, lithics, and this is just sort of like the various ways of. Um, analyzing things. Uh, lithic analysis where you take a look at, uh, and I'm not making this up, every tiny little piece of lithics, sometimes there can be thousands of them. Um, oh, yeah. 
I've I've I for my research I the paper I just published I had to do that where I had to look through thousands of lithics and you take every tiny little piece of them and you look at them with a loop and you examine and try to figure out is this actually a flake is this more than a flake what is it and you know these are sort of like these drawings are sort of like where you get that detail by analyzing it. Uh, you know, and, the, and we look at things like the, um, let's see, where's the striking platform? Uh, did I find one with that? Yeah, yeah, the striking platform, which can be oval in shape, it can be triangular in shape, but generally it's, pre if it, even on tiny little flakes, you can generally suss out what the striking platform is. Uh, if it doesn't have a striking platform, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a flake. There are other things you can look at. But it's much easier to determine if it has a striking platform. Um, you know, you look at the edges here. You look at um, the uh, radial lines. Sometimes there are things called um, uh, Uriel, uh, um, fuck, uh, Uriel scars. I forget. It. I probably butchered that. Um, you know, that happen like say through either biotraversion or say a plow comes through and cuts it. You know. All kinds of things, um, yeah, and that's and that's what we look at is the lithics. Uh, we look at every little inch of those lithics. Uh, then there's also ceramic analysis, which is you take a look at every single piece of pottery, and you look at it for the lot. You look at it for like markings, uh, and also to put it put it back together, like you see here. Um, and we look at everything, like the color, like was it painted like this pot over here, or did it, you know, was it plain, did it have some engravings that were stamped into it or carved into it, what? And, and that allows us to, a lot of times, like lithics, you can, you can date a site based off of the lithics. Usually you need the bottom of a PPK of some sort, um... You know, because the stems or the notches are what dates a, uh, a projectile point. Uh, with pottery, it's what type of engravings or designs were carved in slash painted into it. Yeah, because the clay resource doesn't necessarily change. No, yeah, exactly. It's the designs and the, uh, the stylization of those pieces. Yeah, yeah. And we do eventually put them together. However... As we have, as Arch Wolf and I have also had to deal mm -hmm. with, people, you can only put these pieces of pottery back together in a lab setting. I'm sorry, you can outside of a lab setting, but it damages the artifact. You can only do it without damaging the artifact in a lab setting, because labs, like whether they be CRM or uh, university labs or museum labs, have specific types of glue. Mm -hmm. that are used to glue these things back together so they don't damage the artifact. And those those standards yeah. that come with labeling artifacts, preserving artifacts, reconstructing artifacts, those standards are put into place because after years, decades, of artifact preservation and having artifacts degrade yeah. because the preservation practice was not sufficient. Yeah, exactly. The the practices have come about through trial and error. Mm -hmm. Using just some regular super glue that you get from the hardware store it's on something good. like indigenous pottery <laughs> yeah. will damage it's it. the pottery. Yep. Uh, using a like a super glue liquid as opposed to a gel. Yeah. You'll glue the thing together, but it won't actually uh, knit together. Because that pottery is so porous, mm -hmm. all you've done is dump liquid glue into all the pores and the cracks. Yeah. While this might seem like, oh, you're strengthening it. You're not. There's chemicals in that glue that might start to degrade certain minerals in the pottery. Yep. So you'll have the pottery start to come apart and yeah. disintegrate. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. You could have certain glues that if you glued one of these... Uh, one of these uh, pieces of uh, ceramics here together, it will take that design off. Yeah. It will ruin the imagery. It will cause that the glaze to degrade. Yeah. So there's 
there's glues that are specific mm -hmm. because of you know trial and error the way to label artifacts uh i remember a long time ago it was you used white out and then you drew the number you wrote the number on it with a sharpie and then you put clear nail polish across it yeah that's frowned on oh, and yeah. that was that's in the last 20 years mm -hmm. you know because when i was first in in school for this field I did that at the university, and that practice has gone away. Yeah. Because of, a, you know, a adverse effect. Yeah. Now you, we I use mean, acryloid. Uh, yep. So. There is actually a concern on which paper you use as an artifact tag yep. that's stored with these things. Yeah. Acid or paper with acid-based inks, or preservatives will destroy an artifact yes it might take 10 15 20 years but it will still damage it so when we talk about what in the preservation world as about stuff that's acid free paper certain inks that you use um that's because previously previously used things have shown to degrade the artifact yeah exactly and then and then that leads into our next thing because the preservation of that artifact and making sure it doesn't degrade is actually part of the last step of all archaeological work curation you yep. you need to make sure so curation is is you put the artifact in I don't want to say storage everyone you hear like oh they they have it in storage and in in the museum I mean yes and no it's it's you put it in these repositories in very strict uh, areas for the most part uh, where you can find them uh, be based off of the ascension number and various other things to find it uh, in always environmentally controlled rooms to protect these artifacts and it's done uh, one, maybe, you know, maybe you want to do research in the future, or you need to go back and double check for, like, oh, did we actually find this at the, you know, at the excavation site for this job, you know, and they always go into these state repositories for that, whether they be in university repositories, like, uh, that are also the state repositories, like the uh, repository in Arkansas, or they be in some repository for the federal government. Or in a museum, they go into these these repositories to be stored for further research and documentation. And you need that in order for that to happen. You have to make sure these artifacts don't degrade. And degrade. using these chemicals is not the way to do that. <laughs> and and to give you an idea of how how potentially dangerous, yeah some of these old preservation methods were um there's lots of organic materials feathers hides uh plant fibers and such that had been stored in um in not climate controlled facilities yeah so the climate the, the the hot and the cold is causing problems and causing those things to degrade yeah but there was a concern of exposure to insects yeah and and vermin so a lot of these very perishable artifacts that were leather or feathers or or so or such were sprayed with ddt oh god liberally and um one of the things that no one ever seems to tell you is how <laughs> these things were preserved uh -huh. So when you are testing things for DDT contamination and your little scanner starts screeching <laughs> like you walked into Chernobyl, oh god, should you be handling that with bare hands? Yeah. Now, no, you shouldn't because oh. even the oils off of your hands can compromise and damage an artifact. Yeah, you shouldn't at all, but yeah. But, you know, having DDT and, and arsenics and stuff on these objects does cause other problems yeah 
causes a lot of other problems. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, and then here's just an example of sort of what the shells and stuff and repositories can sort of look like. You know, um, it can vary, but that's sort of what they look like. Um, and it's and it's self-explanatory. We don't really need to go into a lot of detail about this. You can see it in the picture, sort of how it works. <laughs> but that's how we do it. So, you know, uh, and, 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 and the thing is, like we said, there's more than one type of archaeology uh, and more than one mm -hmm. type of anthropology, and it's a very... Uh, all the fields work together. Uh, in archaeology alone, you have... And these are not even all of the archaeological subfields. I was going to say, your list is kind of short there. Yeah, there's a <laughs> lot more. But, like, just in this list alone, you have prehistoric archaeology, historical archaeology, classical archaeology, all the way down to CRM, like what we're talking about. Oh. I mean, there's Mongolian archaeology, which is what I'm trying to go into for grad school, as well as uh, your uh, lithicists. Lithicists, I think, should be their own... Uh, their own... Uh, Category same with ceramicists, um, you know, zooarchaeologists, all kinds of things like that, and then even in the other various different forms of anthropology, which archaeology is a subset of, you have things like uh, bioarchaeology, which is also part of archaeology. I don't know why that was put over there, but whatever. Um, paleoanthropology, primatology, you have uh, ecological anthropology. All of these these branches work together. Historical linguistics, <laughs> you know. Yep. So yeah. Um, so for one thing, that's another thing I wanted. Why I brought this graph up is because if for anyone who's a potential like wants to become an archaeologist in the future, looking at this, you know, unfortunately a lot of people in the past have brought up like, oh, archaeology is a limited degree. No, it's not. Not even a little uh, bit. That comes from people who have no clue what the reality is. What the fuck is. they're talking about. Again. Or they is, watched BuzzFeed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Again, this is a very small list. We're but there's real people. Still, but there's still a lot of possibilities in this small list. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So now that we've gone through that, through the archaeological method, we'll go through probably what's going to be probably the quickest uh, section. Yeah. It's going to be quick. Yeah, is the dark and unfortunate history of archaeology. Uh, and it is pretty dark. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we need to look at the early origins of archaeology. Like, how did archaeology come about? Uh, specifically, one could... <laughs> And I chose the 1800s because if we went back to, like, the various different ancient cultures, like ancient China or the ancient Egyptians or what have you, that practiced uh, what you could argue is archaeology, uh, we'd be here for a whole nother video. In fact, I probably have a video be. about, like, uh, ancient archaeology. Uh, archaeology have to. Yeah, planned. But the origins of the field that we call archaeology in itself came about in the 18th century. And there, That's true. Uh, and in the archaeology that appeared in the 18th century, n not all of it, but a good chunk of it is connected to what we call the mound builder myth, which I know is a misnomer because the mound builders were the Native Americans, but we'll explain that in a second. Okay. So archaeology really in the got its start as a quote unquote scientific field. It is a scientific field, but back back then it wasn't quite that yet. Uh, with individuals such as Thomas Jefferson and William Stuckley. Uh, William Stuckley uh, mainly conducted work on sites in England, uh, such as Stonehenge um, and uh, various other uh, megalithic sites, such as this one you see here, uh, which he called uh, the Druid Temple of uh, Arbury, or uh, Abury, whatever, however it's pronounced in England. Um, and he published a lot of his work, uh, cause he actually did, um, keep a lot of notes on his, on his, uh, it wasn't called archaeology back then, but we'll say archaeological work that he wrote in, uh, books such as, manuscripts such as Aubrey Temple of the British Druids, uh, as well as Stonehenge and Temple Restored. Uh, but... <laughs> And, and, and it should be noted that he he didn't uh, loot the site. He did actually 
uh, treat the sites with respect. However, he also sort of set a precedent for uh, not acknowledging uh, that indigenous peoples of countries could do things. Now, he, he is the exception to the rule in terms of the fact that he didn't think that the Europeans uh, and uh, that the Druids in Europe could do it, but that's also sort of like a Christian uh, pagans were yeah. savages thing anyway, which eventually transferred to people who weren't European. Uh, and he thought that these megaliths were actually uh, built by Phoenicians. Like, then here he talks about, like, Abraham practiced it, and from him are Druids. And then he goes into a tirade about how the Druids were descended from uh the lost tribes of Israel or something like that. Um, and, and how the megaliths, uh, like Aubrey Temple, uh, <laughs> are connected to the Sabbath, which they're not. Uh, and then here's another thing where he's talking about uh, the Egyptians and the, the Jews and the Phoenicians coming to England to build these megalithic circles, and they were the ancestors of the Druids. Again, He's the exception to the rule, because usually these ideas are not in Europe, but considering he's targeting the Druids specifically, who were pagan, um, it still tracks and sets the precedent for that idea that, oh, these savages couldn't have done it. It had to have been Egypt or Atlantis or the reptilian people who crawled out of... Uh, who crawled out of a giant's ass in Atlantis did it, you know? <laughs> I, I think we should, uh, we should, we should clarify something here. When archaeologists and anthropologists point out, um, the issues with attributing somebody, uh, one culture's achievements yeah. to somebody else, that is a tool that came about specifically to discredit a population that was, uh, let, let's call it out of favor. Yeah. In out this of case, favor. yeah. With this site, you see, this this is a completely Christianized Europe. Europe. Um, what is older than Europe and corresponds with the Bible is what you see in Egypt. Yep. And the Middle East, and the Greeks, and the Romans. Yep. So. This is like like Dane said, this is the reverse of what you see with like modern day pseudoscience. Yeah. Where the Europeans are the ones who need help from someone else. Not because they are European and that and they are lesser. Because they it's are because pagan. they're not Christian. Yeah. And that's the that's one of the things that throughout a lot of the pseudo pseudo archaeological stuff that is that still gets perpetrated today especially with shows like Graham Hancock's and stuff like that and, and all and of America that Earth, yeah. stuff comes about because when it was written down the first time when it was postulated was the 1800s mm -hmm. and you've gone away from oh it's now Christian's it's, there, there seems to be sometime in the 1800s this idea that Jesus is, you know, everybody just accepts, well, if you're white, you're white. Yeah. And you're a Christian, obviously. Mm. It then becomes an ethnic thing when you're trying to justify dehumanizing people. Yeah. Um, the the example of uh, that, that Graham Hancock falls on all the time with his mother culture yeah. is the idea that indigenous peoples in the Americas were they moved into ruins and civilizational stuff that was already there. Yeah. That had been built by people who came before them. Or in the tamer version, but no less insulting, is that these peoples were here, the indigenous peoples were here, but they were too simple. Too simple, yeah. And it took Graham Hancock's survivors of Graham Hancock's mother culture to teach them building skills and agriculture yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Which is blatantly false. Yeah, here's So you here's see you have a the religious component and then you have an 
a racial ethnic component yeah. that is driving the why these things or where these things came from. Mm -hmm. Because you can't admit, especially at that time period, that, yeah. the, you know, a, a population that you had enslaved was capable of building cities and using math and making gold and all of these things. Yep. Because then it's they're human too, they're people just like you, and the only difference is their uh, obvious evolutionary adaptation to their environment. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot of it is is based in a lot of this early stuff especially has that component behind it of racism, cultural dismissal, an attempt to either justify taking things from them or forcing something on them, like religion. Yep. The idea that we're bringing them religion and Christianity and civilization is a farce. Yeah. But because they had cities, they had civilization, they had writing systems and 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 economies. They didn't need European help. Yeah. Also, also the term civilization is loaded because it imply it it doesn't take into account that it it, it, impl it implies that you have to have cities to be civilized, and it's like well, yep. there are you you know or only people who live in cities build monuments, which is not true at all. Uh, nomadic That's cultures cool. like say the Mongolian uh, nomads during the Bronze Age through the modern era built uh, various different monuments and various different elaborate tombs, yet they were nomadic horsemen. You know, so yeah. that's... So, yeah, and, and so it's it's all based in uh, religious fervor, xenophobia, uh, which is both the same and different from racism. Um, yeah. Uh, racism and, and all kinds of things. Uh, the work of Jefferson, who was... A l slightly later than uh, Stuckley, uh, was mainly of, uh, involved with the various different mounds in the eastern woodlands of the United States. And Jefferson uh, saw these. I mean, they, they, you know, we have records of these mounds, of, of course, you know, well, there's an archaeological record, but, you know, we have historical documentation of these mounds going all the way back to uh, at least to Soto uh, with his this, with his expedition. Now, to DeSoto's credit, he he wrote down that yes, the Native Americans built these mounds. Um, so he DeSoto's not DeSoto, and then the other Spaniards like Tristan de Luna uh, and Juan Pardo did not dispute that the Native Americans built these mounds. Uh, um, but these mounds were still recorded at least as early as then, and Thomas Jefferson took a great interest in these mounds. Um, this is a Hopewellian mound that you see here. Uh, but also there are mounds like uh, here uh, in Georgia, actually about 30 minutes from me, uh, the Etowah Mounds, which was like, Etowah was like one, the biggest uh, Mississippian city in Georgia, period. Um, estimates, uh, my mentor has given estimates based off the archaeological uh, data as well as the various other sites uh like habitation sites in these areas around here and in the surrounding area, to be around uh, between 10,000 to 16,000, maybe 20,000, which was lar which was larger than London at the time. Um, so yeah, uh, these these mounds were everywhere, and Jefferson took interest in them. Um, like there's also Cahokia, which a lot of people know about, uh, and the mounds that he took interest in specifically were the various mounds on his property on the seven bends of the Shenandoah River. Uh, these mounds here. Uh, and Jefferson thoroughly excavated these uh, very thoroughly uh, and published them in his notes, uh, in his book called Notes on the State of Virginia. And to his credit, he actually acknowledged that it was probably the Native Americans who built this. He actually has a diagram talking about the various different tribes 
uh, in the area that could have done it and, you know, their populations and things like that. So, again, he was not a, a proponent of the, of the Mound Builder myth. However, his work mm. did eventually lead Get to... turned into... Got turned into the Mound Builder myth. So, now we're here. Well, what it, why is it... What, what is the Mound Builder myth? Well, the Mound Builder myth is the idea that a lost white race, whether it be Graham Hancock's Atlantis, because Graham Hancock's theories are nothing more than a relabeled Mound Builder myth, you can't fucking tell me otherwise. Um, oh no, he just completely re he he just rebranded Ignatius Donnelly's book. Yeah. In his in Fingerprints of the Gods. Yeah, exactly. And, but the Mound Builder myth is the idea that some ancient white civilization uh, and white is nebulous because they also include Egypt and uh, the Phoenicians and the Lost Tribes of Israel, who by our modern standards would not necessarily be considered white. Um, because the definition of white has changed over the past couple hundred years. But the idea of some lost white civilization came here and built these uh, these mounds. Uh, sometimes they were attributed to, say, the Vikings, um, or Atlantis, because Ignatius, Ignatius Donnelly used the Atlantis idea of the, in, in, um, conjunction with the Mound Builder myth. Um, uh, again, the Lost Tribes of Israel have been brought up. Uh, and the idea is that whoever it was, whether it be the Vikings, the Egyptians, uh, Atlantis, or the Lost Tribes of Israel, they came here and built a beautiful civilization. And then these, and I say this with as much annoyance because it is incredibly racist, but this group of savage native of uh, savage indians came in here and battled this white civilization and slaughtered them and they're evil and all this other horrible racist shit uh yeah. and that's you know and they and they and these settlers drew these pictures like this one you see here called ancient american battle mound showing one of these quote-unquote battles um that's, that's and how that works though <laughs> yeah yeah and the and then like and this mound builder myth was used uh, and uh, spread by a whole lot of figures. Uh, for one thing, the Book of Mormon to this day is still a Joseph proponent. Joseph Smith character. Yeah. Yeah, is still a proponent of the Mound Builder myth in some versions. Theirs is the Lost Tribes of Israel version. Uh, and then you have people like Andrew Jackson who used the Mound Builder myth as justification for the Indian Removal Act. Uh, basically yes, saying indeed. that, well, the, the Cherokee and their ancestors and the Creek and their ancestors and all and the other tribes of the Southeast and their ancestors, they came in here and slaughtered the original inhabitants, so therefore we're justified in removing them from their homelands too. Um, and then, and then uh, Abraham Lincoln was a proponent of it, and he even stated in a, in a uh, speech, no, it was a letter, he stated in a letter that everyone knew that the true builders of the mounds were this ancient lost race of giants, which we'll get into that in a second, too. Because that's also part of the mound builder myth. Uh, and because of this, a whole bunch of frauds were brought forward during the 1800s and early 1900s, such as the Newark Keystone and the Decalogue Stone, which supposedly had... Uh, uh, either sometimes Mesopotamian, sometimes uh, uh, Semitic script on them. However, to their credit, there were actually a lot of skeptics back then, like Charles Whittlesley, who was a geologist, who uh, talked about it in, his, uh, in a paper he published called um, Historical and Archaeological Tracts in number nine, uh, volume number nine. And in it, he talks about the Newark stone and the key, various keystones, uh, and their uh, and and people can pause to read and their efficacy on whether or not they were built by uh, they were made by an ancient white race or by the Hebrews. And he says the stone had not the appearance of great antiquity, but it suggested that it had been buried uh, buried for maybe at uh, at most 
50 years. And then he goes on to say, um, uh, it is more probably the work of another party who must have industriously studied the runic or bardic alphabet. It can only be attributed to uh, an innate pleasure in the practice of deception amounting to uh, uh, monomania. Uh, so basically he's saying they're, they're horseshit. He's like, they're complete horseshit. Yeah. They're not real. He's like, they're, they're fakes. <laughs> but that still didn't stop other people from bringing other versions of the Mound Builder myth, which again are still touted to this day. I've had to argue the point with people before uh, that an ancient race of giants who were also uh, unsurprisingly white <laughs> yep. uh, came and built the mounds. Uh, in fact, there were very, for one thing, these uh, these mound these ideas of the mound builder myth led people similar to Thomas Jefferson, uh, in, including plantation owners, to start plowing through these mounds, like you see here, uh, where they forced enslaved Africans to excavate uh, this mound in, Miss in the Mississippi Valley, plowing through burial tracks, which is again why. NAGPRA eventually was implemented because burials that were looted. Um, but, be, you know, but, uh, oh yeah, that's why I was going to bring this up. So the, it led, the Mount Blue myth led these plantation owners in these towns and what have you to plow through these, these mounds. Uh, and during these excavations, yellow journalism articles were written about them. Uh, oh, one yes. is actually about the Etowah Mounds, again, about 30 minutes from me, where they talk about uh, strange discoveries made in an Indian mound near Cartersville, Georgia, where they say uh, some uh, people who were like seven feet tall, uh, seven feet two inches were found, you know, in, in height were found. Of course, they not taken into account that when you decay, your bones tend to separate, and so you can look taller than you actually do until somebody who's like an osteologist or what have you actually puts the bones back together the way they're supposed to go, and then what somebody who may look seven or eight feet tall might be five feet tall, you know? Uh, but, the, but they found that skeleton, and they're like, giants! It was, see, we, we have proof it was giants! You know, and then you have other yellow journalism articles, like the one on the right saying, men eight feet tall once roamed in local forests. And using, you know, archaeological evidence that they looted from graves and such as justification. One of those things that takes away provenience, mm -hmm. so you can't actually prove it. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and then you have... The other, the other cause ah, of the continue. Cardiff Giant. Yes, the Cardiff Giant, uh, which was a giant that was so. So there was this individual. Um, what was it? What was his name? Let me actually look up his name. I have a, a book about him right here. Uh, hang on a second, because <laughs> it's it's hilarious. Uh, the true story of it. Oh, it was. It was meant to be... Uh, oh, here, here, here it goes. Yeah, 51. Yeah, I, I know what it was meant to be. I was trying to look up his name because uh, I forgot his name. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it was um, it was a man by the name of Hull. Uh, let's see here. What's his name here? Oh, yeah, George Hull. So George Hull, was who himself was a skeptic, he w he didn't believe in the in the giant myth whatsoever. He was like it's horseshit. But he got into an argument with somebody who who did believe it and believed it was connected to the Bible. And so George Hall went out, purchased a cast, purchased a whole bunch of uh, cement, and poured it into the cask to make the giant. <laughs> oh, I was under the impression that this was a carved piece of. Um, oh, it may have been a car. Yeah, yeah, it was and a car. Gypsum. A, yeah. And and it was found that a German stone carver in Chicago made it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're right. I don't know why I thought it was a cast, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It was P.T. Barnum made one. Well, oh, no, P.T. Barnum made one. 
Yeah, Pizza Farm made one, and so George Hull made this giant, and he he took it out and he buried it. The ultimate troll. Yeah, he buried it, and then he waited a few months, and then he took the guy he had had the argument with out to that land, and they quote unquote stumbled on it, and of course the guy immediately believed it, uh, and eventually you know, and here's uh, the excavation, right here in 1869, but eventually George Hull was like, hey dude, guess what? I made the shit up. It's not real, and he admitted it publicly, like he admitted it publicly. However, after he charged people oh, twenty poor. cents a piece to see it. Yep, yep. Just so he could prove that people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, but eventually, P.T. Barnum <laughs> and his yeah. and his and his partner Bailey, I forget uh, Bailey's first name. They got, uh, you know, they got. Uh, well, for one thing. Experts like Andrew Dickinson and Charles Marsh, who were paleontologists and uh, anthropologists, examined the Cardiff giant and were immediately like, it's horseshit. They're like, it's not real, it's gypsum, or, you know, what have you. They're like, it wasn't carved by any of the ancient civilization. It's pretty obvious it was relatively young, you know. But P.T. Barnum was like, huh, that guy made a lot of money off of it. I bet you I can make more. And so he he purchased the original... He purchased the card... No, he didn't purchase the card of giant. Sorry. He paid the guy who had carved the card of giant to carve another one, which is the one we saw in the first slide, and he charged even more money for it, claiming that, oh, no, Hull, didn't, Hull lied about hoaxing it. He had... P.T. Barnum and his partner Bailey, they have the original card of giant, and it was real. And so, of course... Because P.T. Barnum, being the showman and the liar that he is, um, people now still believe to this day that the Carved Giant is real, despite the original maker admitting that he made the shit up. Which directly impacts archaeology. <laughs> then we have, uh, over in Europe, we have Giovanni Belzoni and the origins of Egyptology. So Giovanni Belzoni, I believe, was Italian. Um... And he was originally a circus strongman. He was a circus strongman. He was very massive. Um, and eventually his, his work as a circus strongman sort of began to dry up. Uh, coinc coincidentally, the Napoleonic invasions of Egypt seen on the right had actually concluded, and they sort of opened up Egypt to artifact hunting, uh, which was on the rise at the time. So Belzoni, uh, being he, he didn't want to actually loot any artifacts. He wanted his artifacts that he found to go into a museum. He was not an archaeologist. He never claimed to be an archaeologist. But he did want them to go into a museum. Um, some of them, unfortunately, were looted. Uh, the guy he was giving the artifacts to turned out to be selling them, on, uh, selling them to people instead of putting them in museums. He summarily broke off business with that guy. Uh... But a lot of his artifacts did end up in a museum, and it was his work that uh, we ha uh, can thank uh, for the uh, discovery of this giant, you can see for scale over here, uh, statue of Ramesses II. At the time it was called uh, Memnon, uh, but Ramesses II, which he and his crew hauled all the way back to Cairo. <laughs> Uh, and then he also dis was discovered the first couple of tombs in the Valley of Kings, including uh, the tomb of Seti the first that you see over here on the left. Uh, he also is the one who discovered the Temple of Abu Simbel uh, that you see here. Here's a drawing of it when he found it. Um, so he really was sort of one of the pioneers of Egyptology. Unfortunately, as I said, some of his artifacts were sold on, on what would be the equivalent of the black market, though of course it was legal back then, um, much to his chagrin because he wanted them to go into a museum. Um, but also, it led to a whole bunch of rich jackasses from Europe to also come in and loot whatever artifacts they want. Also, a lot of native Egyptians uh, as well, uh, one of them seen here. Uh, and one of the practices that they would do is they would take mummies that they took from tombs and literally eat them. They would they would either grind them up into powder or they would just eat them. Like, oh, this foot looks really nice. Damn crazy Victorian. Yeah. 
that, this <laughs> foot looks really nice. I, I think I'll have it medium rare, you know, or some shit. I'll have some of that. <laughs> yeah. And 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 I, we're not making this up. This is this is true. Uh, oh boy, was it gross? <laughs> Uh, and of course, the British Museum looted, liberated as they called it, looted a whole lot of artifacts and brought them to their museum. Uh, many of the countries of origin are still trying to get these artifacts back to this day, uh, which you can see here. Now, we're on to somebody that I know is Archeowulf's favorite archaeologist, yeah. <laughs> he said sarcastically, Heinrich Schliemann. The guy who found yeah. Troy. So Heinrich Schliemann was not an archaeologist. He was uh, what was his profession again? Archaeologist? Wolf? Like wasn't he a doctor or something like that? Yeah, God, I want to say he was a dentist, but I can't. Remember. Something like that. Something like that. Anyways, so I don't he, know everything about him that was decent went out the window when he started blowing stuff up. I, I will get to that. We'll get to that. But uh, but so so Heinrich Schliemann was a. It was a medical doctor of some sort, whether he be dentist or what have you, who took a great interest in the ancient world. And he, to his credit, he used the Odyssey, the Iliad and the Odyssey to find the possible site of Troy, uh, which you can see uh, his group excavating over here. However, <laughs> to get to those levels, he blew through nine levels of archaeological remains with dynamite. Uh, that you can see yep, here. including the lair that was the Hellenistic period when the Trojan War would have been. Well, it, actually, the Trojan War would have probably been during the, uh, uh, from what I, I, I read this during, from uh, a book called um, 1177, the year the uh, the year uh, uh, civilization ended or something by a uh, Mediterranean archaeologist, and he puts Troy more like at the, uh, like the uh, Mycenaean era. But, Still, uh, Heinrich Schliemann destroyed that layer too. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, and it, this, and I almost expect this is how the conversation went. The over, in that meme over there, he's just like, "Yeah, it took me about ten minutes," you know, or or something like that. I can only imagine. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, in fact, much of the archaeo art of much of the academic work uh, about Troy. The side of Troy taught is is aimed at cleaning up Hein Heinrich Schliemann's fuck up, uh, fuck ups, uh, because he was also a looter. He took various gold objects that he called Priam's treasure and gave them to his wife, who would wear them to galas. And here they are, finally in a museum. But it doesn't change the fact that he looted them and gave these gold objects of historical and archaeological significance to his wife. <sighs> yeah. Now we move on to the 20th century, which is where, uh, believe it or not, sometimes even worse things happen. Uh, such as the Piltdown Man hoax, which is not is not worse than the Troy thing, but it's still pretty bad. So. The Piltdown Man was this proposed hominid uh, found by Charles Dawson in uh, Piltdown, England. Uh, seen excavating it here. Uh, and he proposed that this proved that this skull, the skull fragments that he found, proves that humanity didn't evolve in Africa, that they evolved in Europe. Very racist thinking. Again, going back to that idea of Christian superiority and xenophobia. Um, and even when it was proven that humanity evolved from Africa, evolved in Africa, not in Europe, it was still thought that Piltdown Man was a some sort of uh, hominid ancestor. Um, in fact, um, you know, it's, it's, it, they, it was believed that for, for, uh, Centuries, yeah, I believe that for decades. I believe that for about 40 years. Everyone in the university, uh, I forget, I think it was Oxford, but I'm not 100% sure, thought it was real. Everyone, every single one of these scientists, including Dawson over here, thought it was real. However, in the 1950s, that all changed because the uh, physical anthropologist Kenneth Oakley uh, re examined them in 1953. 
Here he is re-examining them over here. Uh, and he determined that no, they were not a fossil hominid. Uh, one, the materials were stained to make them look old, so obviously somebody tampered with the bones. Uh, here's what they look like now in the museum that they're currently resting in, talking about the staining of the bones. Uh, two, a lot of the bone fragments weren't even of humans. They were from orangutans, like the jawbone. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was a hoax, and a hoax that fooled scientists for 40 one years. Nobody knows who did it. Um, most think it was probably Dawson or somebody working with Dawson. You know, some, maybe somebody trying to fool Dawson. Either way, Dawson was involved. I personally think he's he's the one who faked it. He, he's the one who, who could Not have benefited famous. the most from it. But, you know. What'd you say, Archie Wolf? It got him famous. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but either way, it was a hoax. Uh, so there's that. Then we come on to what I, what is definitely worse than Heinrich Schliemann. Nazi yep. archaeology. Uh, because yes, even though the Indiana Jones movies are fake, this is not. So the Nazi party, which of course began to rise in the 1930s, really 1929, but whatever, 1930s, uh, was, as I'm sure nobody's surprised, was very white supremacist. And they wanted to prove the supremacy and the um, godliness, and I'm not making that up, godliness of the white race. So they sent out these archaeological expeditions. Uh, specifically from the uh, the Anarba, um, the archaeology, the Nazis archaeology division, and the Anarba sent out expeditions to areas like Scandinavia, where th they looked at the petroglyphs, which are still actually looked at by, archae by archaeologists because you know they are ancient and they do provide a lot of information. It's just the Nazi information was, of course, racist. Dude, they used it as like, oh, see, Atlantis landed here, and, and this is where the German race came from, and so the German race is descended from Atlantis, and so therefore we are demigods, which is not true, you know. Um, it's also thanks to the Nazis that we have, that for decades we had what was called the Ermensil symbol, uh, which was supposed to be a, represent a representation of the Ermensil uh either temple or god post is described in the Frankish Annals, uh, which is essentially was a god post that Charlemagne, when he was conquering Germany, uh, saw the Saxons praying to. He massacred all 4,500, uh, not, all, not all of them, but he massacred 4,500 of them for praying to this pagan idol. Um, the thing is, it was probably what is called a god post that probably looked nothing like this. This is from a church where there are a whole bunch of palm trees around it and it's depicting a biblical scene. So, yeah, we have them to thank for that. They also went and looked at Slavic runes and things like that, which, of course, were connected to the quote-unquote white race. Um, the most egregious to me is they used eugenics, which, I mean, they used that, we know that, but they used eugenics and went to East Asia, specifically areas like southern China and Tibet, and they measured the skulls of Asian people to prove the the le, how less intelligent they were and how genetically inferior they were to the white race. Uh, and then they also proposed ideas of uh, expeditions to go to places like Tiwanaku in South America that never really materialized, uh, but they did propose these ideas because they wanted to go and prove that these were Atlantis and therefore prove their theory that the German race was descended from Atlantis. Um, all of this is incredibly horrible. Um, and, you know, and, and that sort of ends the, the slide, but to, to sort of leave off on, all of that past, all of that dark past, is why archaeology is what it is today. Archaeology has done a pretty damn good job, especially in the last 40 years, of acknowledging its past and, and saying, hey, we need to never do that shit ever a fucking again. We need to say fuck you to the Nazis, we need to say fuck you to Schliemann, and we need to do things right. 
We need to do contrary things. Contrary to what Hancock says. Yeah. We're contrary to what Hancock says. We need to do things methodically and based off of evidence. Two random teeth are not evidence. One single flake is not evidence. Sorry, they're evidence, but they're not, they're not sufficient evidence. I should say sufficient evidence is the key word. You need to... If, if a court case can get thrown out of a, of a court, like, say, involving a murder or a theft or what have you, due to insufficient evidence, so too so can an archaeological theory. Yeah, so, so too can hypothesis, yeah. Atlantean people. Yeah, especially when these Atlantean hypotheses are based off of misconstruing and lying about what academic papers say, because, which is what like people like Graham Hancock and Scott Walters and uh, such do, is they, they take ac actual academic papers and then lie about what the academic papers are actually saying. Misrepresentation. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, especially when you look at, at how they are presenting stuff and the things they are talking about when it comes to their evidence... Uh, these shows, like Graham Hancock's show and yeah. stuff, they're relying on archaeological work that was done in the 1920s. Yep. Exactly. They, are work they are looking at archaeological processes that were done prior to 1960. Yeah. Because they're it gives them the ability to impose some sort of of it, their interpretation on something that with all admission we not interpret correctly yeah. because it was 1925 when that site was excavated yeah or they look at or they look at things that even by the standards of that day were disproven like the uh like the keystones or the Kensington rune stone or whatever oh, yeah. that it were already disproven and were already like or the Cardiff giant or what have you or were that experts even back then uh, or the mound builder myth that even Thomas Jefferson the first guy to actually excavate uh, Native American mounds admitted were built by Native Americans and they ignore that and they're like they don't know what they're fucking talking about we're right the mound builder myth is right. Mm -hmm. The Mormons are right. You know, it was Atlantis. And Atlantis, you know, not only did Atlantis exist, but they also somehow could use LSD and ayahuasca to literally open a fucking stargate to heaven. I'm not making yeah, but, that up. That is one of Graham no? Hancock's beliefs. Archie Wolf can attest to this. We have seen yeah, the videos. He, he's, he, like, came out and said, I've been stoned for 24 years, and I'm like... No, really? That's not It was surprising. in a TED Talk or something. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. It, yeah, one of, the, one of the, the biggest issues when it comes to the, especially with these, these pseudoscience, pseudo-archaeology um, presentations and books and such yeah. is they first... They, they say, hey, look at what the archaeologists did. And they set it up as the archaeologists knew what they were doing. And then they <laughs> stab the archaeologists in the back and say, but all of this stuff is wrong. Yeah. Because, because they are also relying on the archaeology is incorrect yeah. because it was done in 1925. Yep. Graham exactly. Hancock does not cite the papers at the... Uh, Pyramid of Quilco, nope. that's Quilco, um, yeah. that have been written after 1970. Yeah, he doesn't address them at all. He nope. might as well not know they exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or so papers... that's where he goes. Oh, look, this archaeologist did it, but then it was wrong. Yeah, or he doesn't the... tell you how he knows that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is ironically the papers he won't talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or it's it, it uh, is the, incredible. Yeah. Or the papers about like like the the younger Dryas that were the younger Dryas event that were written after the nineties when the younger Dryas hypothesis was first proposed. You know that that don't debunk the younger Dryas hypothesis, but they're like, oh, 
it was a little more complex than we originally thought. It wasn't a necessarily a world ending event. It was a lot more complex. And in some case, in a lot of cases, it either had no effect on the human population there, or it was actually the cause of the development of uh, social complexity. Uh, not the, you know, it wasn't the destroyer of social complexity. It helped social complexity and technological advancement begin, you know? Yeah. So it's just sort of like, yeah. So, so yeah, these are why archaeology is the way it is. Uh, there's the, ar the, you know, these are the archaeological methods, and these are the laws that archaeology abides by in the U.S. and worldwide. So, yeah, that was a, 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 a longer video than I, um, than one might have expected, but it's a lot of information that we needed to get across. And it's still, yeah. we could still keep going. There's a lot more information that we could have packed in there, but then it would have been like a 10 hour mo a 10 hour video. So yeah, we'll have to figure out, a, we actually have to do a podcast or something. I think. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So anyway, so there you have it. So, um, as always, I hope you all enjoyed the video. I uh, hope you all learned a little better how archaeology works. Um, if you want to see us cover any of these subjects later in more detail, leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, and I hope you all uh, uh, and uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe. So. Yep. And thank you to Archie Wolf for uh, coming on and helping with this. So, oh, yeah. of course.